Thank you. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure to be here tonight uh, among friends, as you said. I'm uh, always delighted to be in Israel. Um, what I thought I would do tonight is to avoid a boring, comprehensive lecture and make a rather short presentation focusing on the novel antiplatelet therapies in ACS. I think that uh, obviously from what I see in the uh, registry that you've just shown, you don't need any introduction to aspirin, clopidogrel, and the anticoagulant therapy in ACS. So I have focused my presentation on the new aspects. And I should uh, state that I have uh, various relationships with industry, and specifically, I was a steering committee member in the Triton study, studying Prasugrel, in the Plato study, studying Ticagalor, and in the current OASIS 7 study uh, of Clopidogrel. So I was involved in all three big recent studies of novel antiplatelet therapies, and we'll touch about about a new, there new future other therapies that are being tested. So if I want to discuss novel antiplatelet therapies, I should start with Prasugrel. And you know that Prasugrel is a drug that's very similar to Clopidogrel, but has a much quicker and much more efficient metabolism from a prodrug into an active compound. Basically, the pathway that transforms the prodrug into the active metabolite is both shorter and more efficient with prasugrel than it is with clopidogrel. <coughs> However, if you think of the active metabolites, the active metabolite of clopidogrel and the active metabolite of prasugrel are of similar efficiency. So that if you look at the platelet response to clopidogrel in to the left and prasugrel to the right, you can see that the inhibition of platelet aggregation is both more consistent and higher with prasugrel than it is with clopidogrel, in which you have tremendous variability in the response to, to uh, clopidogrel, with an average inhibition that is in the range of 30% when you use that specific test, using ADP response. But when you look at prasugrel, you have a response of 60 to 70%, and much more homogeneous. However, if you test the active metabolites ex vivo on platelets, then the response to the active metabolite of prasugrel and the response to the active metabolite of clopidogrel are almost identical. So prasugrel is a clopidogrel that is very well metabolized and very quickly metabolized. Now, as you know, prasugrel was compared to clopidogrel in patients with ACS that were triaged to undergo PCI and was a associated with a 20% reduction in cardiovascular endpoints specifically cardiovascular mortality, MI and stroke, at the expense of an increase of approximately a third in major bleeding events. That reduction by 19% uh, was largely driven by a reduction in non-fatal non myocardial infarction. There was a trend for a reduction in cardiovascular mortality, modest, and there was a very modest trend for all-cause mortality. Non-fatal stroke was not affected. Importantly, the effect of prasugrel was homogeneous across various subgroups with no statistical significant or interaction according to type of ACS, gender, age, diabetes presence, type of stent, use of GPI, or renal function. So that in all of these subgroups, the effect is assumed to be similar to the overall effect. Now what about bleeding? Uh, as we've discussed, there was an increase in major bleeding events by approximately a third. Fortunately, the major bleeding are relatively rare, 1.8% versus 2.4%. Life-threatening bleeding, which are more severe bleeds, were also increased by 50%. Non-fatal bleeds by were not significantly increased. Fatal bleeds were increased statistically significantly by 0.3% absolute difference, but fortunately the rate is very small and ICH was identical overall, even though there was a, an increase in ICH <coughs> in patients with a prior history of stroke or TIA, and that will come back to this. Specifically, if you try to do an analysis of net clinical benefit, and it's very debatable whether this is an appropriate endpoint, but if you try to somehow subtract from the clinical benefit in the primary endpoint the major bleeding, you can see that the group that has prior stroke or TIA has actually a negative result overall, and the patients who are elderly or with a low body weight have a neutral result. And this is the reason why most of the agencies in Europe and North America 
have recommended against the use of pradoglelin, that subset was for a stroke or TIA, and recommended using a lower dose in patients with a higher age or a low body weight in order to minimize the bleeding that's associated with these features. The second agent that's novel and that is not on the market yet, and I understand it's not on the market in Israel as well, uh, is ticagrelor. Ticagrelor is slightly different from prazugrel and clopidogrel because it's not a thionopyridine and it's not irreversible. It's a uh, reversible agent with a different chemical structure. It's a CPTP inhibitor of the P2Y12 receptor. It is not a pro-drug and does not require metabolic activation. It has rapid onset of the inhibition, greater inhibition than clopidogrel, but the, the binding between the drug and the receptor is reversible so that there is an offset of the effect that is quicker than with clopidogrel. And that is being shown in this study called the Onset Offset Study by Paul Gerbel. In that study, there is a comparison of the inhibition to of platelet function after adding ADP to platelets. With clopidogrel, when you start therapy, continue therapy and discontinue therapy. And with ticagrelor, when you start therapy, continue therapy and discontinue, th discontinue therapy. And you can see that you have a much faster effect, a much more potent if inhibition of platelet aggregation with the loading dose of ticagrelor than with clopidogrel. But interestingly, when you discontinue therapy, even though you start from lower with clopidogrel, it still takes you longer to normalize platelet function than it takes with ticagrelor. Note that the scale is not linear, the scale is logarithmic, so that if you discontinue therapy here, it takes four to five days for clopidogrel to return to normal, for platelet function to return to normal after clopidogrel discontinuation, and you achieve the same level one to two days earlier with ticagrelor. Ticagrelor was tested uh, versus clopidogrel in another large trial called PLATO. PLATO had a number of features that are slightly different from what was uh, used in Triton. First of all, it addressed patients regardless of whether they were clopidogrel naive or not. You could be on clopidogrel and be entered in, in uh, uh, PLATO. The loading dose of clopidogrel was 300 milligrams, but if patients, if physicians wanted, they could reload the patients with another 300 milligrams for PCI, so that a sizable fraction of the population received 600 milligram loading dose of clopidogrel, which obviously is important because it acts more potently and quicker than the standard loading dose of 300 milligram, and of course it's important when you compare it to a new agent. So the specific design features of PLATO is that there was upstream treatment, i.e. at the point of clinical decision making, not after angiography, so that patients were randomized far earlier in PLATO than they were in Triton. It was not restricted to ACS managed with PCI, but also included medically managed ACS and cabbage treated ACS patients. As I indicated, there was a modern comparator. There was no artificial delay in clopidogrel load, and 600 milligrams of clopidogrel was allowed. It was not restricted to clopidogrel naive patients. And finally, another feature that is important is that the bleeds were analyzed by intention to treat. There was no exclusion of cabbage related bleeds. Whereas in Triton, the major bleeds that are presented are non-cabbage-related major bleeds. Fortunately, very few patients in Triton did undergo cabbage. The results of PLATO, I'm sure you've heard before, there was a 16% reduction in the primary composite endpoint, which was the same endpoint as the one used in Triton. But I think what sets PLATO apart from Triton is that not only was there a reduction in the primary endpoint and in other important secondary endpoints of PLATO, but in a pre-specified hierarchical analysis of endpoints in PLATO, there was also a reduction in cardiovascular mortality by 21%, which also was statistically significant. Because stroke was not significant, we cannot claim superiority on all-cause mortality, even though there was also a 22% reduction in all-cause mortality, which did reach on its own statistical significance, but it came after stroke, which did not reduce, which was not reduced by Chicago law, so we cannot claim that all-cause mortality was reduced by Chicago law. But certainly the cardiovascular mortality reduction is important. What was the price to pay in major bleeding? Well, if you look at major bleeding according to the Plato definition or the Timmy definition, there was no difference in major bleeding. If you look at transfusions, which after all is a fairly standard way of looking <coughs> at major bleeding, the need for transfusion was identical in the two groups. If you look at life-threatening bleeding, it was identical. 
And if you look at fatal bleeding, it was identical, 0.3%, very rare. Now, I don't think that this sums up the evidence regarding bleeding, and I want to touch upon bleeding a little more in detail. First of all, I showed you that there was no difference in overall major bleeding. But that is actually divided into cabbage-related bleeds and non-cabbage-related bleeds. You might remember that approximately 10% of the patients in Plato did undergo cabbage. And as you can see, two-thirds of the major bleeds are cabbage-related. So cabbage-related bleeds are not a small footprint in, on bleeding. They're not a footnote. They're an important component of bleeding. Now, if you look at non-cabbage-related bleeds, there is a significant increase with ticagrelor compared to clopidogrel, and the increase is statistically significant. So I would not say that ticagrelor does not include bleeding. I think it's very important to acknowledge this. The other point I want to touch upon is minor and minimal bleeding. If you look at minor bleeding, the minor bleeding was 4.8% with ticagrelor, 42 events, and uh, 3.8% with um, clopidogrel. It's not 42, it's 442 events and 343 events. And minor bleeding, I think, is a misnomer because as you might remember, a minor bleeding is a fall in hemoglobin by three grams with transfusion of less than two units of blood. Typically, a GI bleed that doesn't cause transfusion of more than two units of blood would be called a minor bleed. If that bleed were happening to any of us, I doubt that we would say this is a minor event. I had a minor incident yesterday. I had a GI bleed and I, I received one unit of transfusion blood. So I think it's important to remember that this major and minor classifications are very weak. And you might be aware of the recent efforts to come up with a unified definition of bleeding that avoids this subjective terms, uh, minor, major, life-threatening. It's called the BARC definition for bleeding that just came out in circulation. And I hope that in the future, everybody will report bleeding according to the BARC standard neutral definition rather than the emotional definition of major, minor, and so on and so forth. The final point I want to make regarding Tukagodol is that procedure-related bleeding was identical, and non-procedure-related bleeding was not identical. It was increased with Tukagodol compared to control. So overall, I think Tukagodol is a rather safe drug, but it does increase, increase procedural bleeding, it does increase minor bleeding, and it does increase non-cabbage-related bleeding. I think it's very important to acknowledge that. What about kangaroo? There are another, there's a last point I didn't discuss, but I should have put the slide in here, and you might know of it, but if you don't know of it, you have to be aware that Ticagolo has two side effects that are very specific to this drug and are not seen with other drugs. First, it causes dyspnea in 10% of the patients, approximately, and second, it causes bradycardia. And it's interesting that the, it has these side effects. These side effects are minor. They rarely lead to treatment discontinuation. They don't lead to need for pacemaker insertion. They don't have, they don't input changes in x-ray or functional lung, lung, lung tests. And they're reversible when you stop therapy. Now, why is it interesting to know this? First of all, it's important to know it because your patients might report dyspnea or bradycardia. But most important because they point to the fact that these side effects indicate that likely ticagrelor increases adenosine levels in the blood. And those of you who do adenosine testing know very well that adenosine causes dyspnea and bradycardia. But adenosine also has been implicated in good, so good things. It improves endothelial function, it's antithrombotic, it preconditions the myocardium, it increases uh, blood flow, and therefore it might be responsible for some of the good things that ticagrelor does, including may potentially participate in the mortality reduction. I acknowledge that this is largely hypothetical, but I think it's important to be aware that ticagrelor may have off-target benefits and side effects. The third drug I wanted to touch upon is cangrelor. Cangrelor is quite similar to ticagrelor. It's a non-thionopyridine direct P2Y12 receptor antagonist. It has a rapid onset and offset. It's an IV agent. And it's to platelet function very much what nitroprusside is to blood pressure. You turn it on, you inhibit platelets. You turn the perfusion off, platelet function returns to normal within minutes. It has linear kinetics with no interference with renal or hepatic function. So it's a very potent and reversible quick action agent. 
You might be aware that it's been tested versus clopidogrel or placebo in two large-scale studies called CHAMPION, CHAMPION PCI and PLATFORM. Overall, none of these two studies reached its primary endpoint, so both studies were negative. But I want to share with you some data from CHAMPION PLATFORM, which I think is interesting. This is a comparison of Kangerlor compared to placebo in the acute phase of ACS undergoing PCI. The primary endpoint is reduced, but the reduction is not statistically significant. But look at stent thrombosis and look at mortality, and you have a statistically significant reduction in stent thrombosis with a huge reduction, as well as a statistically significant reduction in mortality, even though it was low, 0.7%, it was reduced to 0.2%, to 0.3% with Kangerlor. And that is intriguing enough that the company that is behind the two failed trials felt that it was worthwhile to embark on a third study called Champion Phoenix. It's actually very appropriate to call it a phoenix. It's uh, born again from the ashes. And so Phoenix will try to test Kangerlor versus clopidogrel in the whole spectrum of coronary artery disease patients treated by PCI. And uh, will have a primary endpoint that looks at all cause mortality and incorporate stent thrombosis at 48 hours to try to demonstrate that there is, there is genuine clinical benefit with this agent. Interestingly, Kangrelor, by the way, also increases adenosine levels in the blood. The fourth agent I want to touch upon is alinegrel. Alinegrel is a, an interesting mixture of the two previous agents. It is a reversible agent. It is not a pro-drug. It's direct acting. And it exists both in IV form and in oral form. So it, you have a Kangrelor alinegrel and a Kangrelor alinegrel, if you will, the oral and the IV. So it might be interesting in the acute phase. What's interesting with Kangrelor is that, in theory, the effect of Kangrelor will vary according to the ADP concentration in the, in the milieu. If you have a low ADP concentration, when ADP is consumed by thrombosis, the drug is very potent, and you have full effect of inhibition of the P2I, P2I12 receptor by alinegrel. But because it's a competitive receptor inhibitor, if you have some ADP in the milieu, as you would see in the context of hemostasis or bleeding, then the effect of alinegrel would be minimized on platelets, and in theory, you would have less potency of alinegrel. So that the drug would be very active when there is thrombosis, but the drug would be less active if there is bleeding. So that sounds like an attractive combination. Unfortunately, this is still largely theoretical. We still have to see proof of this interesting concept. We have had a number of small phase two studies, the largest one being the Innovate PCI study that was reported uh, late last year by uh, Suni Rao that showed that you have indeed a very potent effect of the IV formulation that is sustained with the oral dosing, more potent than clopidogrel. Now, a large phase three trial was about to start called Eclipse and that was canceled at the last minute because of dosing formulation problems. And I think there's uh, work ongoing to try to design an ACS study using the IV oral combination of this agent. I also should mention that there are issues regarding liver safety of this compound. So that's also a question mark that's hanging out there on this program. But I think alinegrel is an interesting uh, candidate for the future. And finally, there is a fifth category of oral antiplatelet agents that is being tested. It's the TRA antagonist. They are inhibitors or antagonists of the thrombin receptor on the platelets. And there are two agents, for Apaxar and Etopaxar. Now, you know that there is a, there's a myriad receptor on the platelets. There are receptors to thromboxane, which are inhibited by thromboxane inhibitors, including aspirin. You have the P2I12 receptors, uh, inhibited by all of the uh, ADP receptor antagonists. You have PDE, recept in, uh, PDE plays a role and is inhibited by diperidamol and silostazole. And you have PAR receptors, PAR1 and PAR4, but in humans it's only PAR1 that is important. And these thrombin receptors are receptors for thrombin that have direct antagonists, namely vorapaxar and etopaxar. Why is this receptor important? First of all, because it, it participates into the activation of platelets and therefore even though you have inhibition of the ADP receptor and the thromboxin receptor, you might have residual activation by the PAR1, but also because thrombin will also contribute directly to fibrin formation, and therefore by inhibiting this receptor, you might inhibit both thrombin formation and platelet activation. This is the chemical structure of the two compounds. This one is manufactured by Schering, which was recently 
bought by Merck, so now it's a Merck compound. And this is manufactured by a Japanese company called Eizai. And they've completed a number of phase two studies and are wondering whether to embark on a phase three. What about Vorapaxar? Vorapaxar, the preclinical studies have suggested that this agent could increase the antithrombotic properties without increasing bleeding or clotting times. And indeed, in phase two studies, if you compare TRA to placebo, you have a reduction in the composite endpoint of death or MACE in PCI-treated patients. And it seems to be dose-related. There's a trend, at least, for an increase in potency in relation to dose. But if you look at bleeding, Compared to placebo, you have no increase in bleeding. Remember, this is compared to placebo. No more bleeding than placebo. So that, of course, is very intriguing. Uh, do we have, at last, the possibility to get a free lunch, to have a potent antithrombotic that would not cause increased bleeding? I think that's a question mark. What I find a little worrying is that if you look at the dose relationship, you do see a dose relationship in bleeding. So to me, that tells me that there is some increase in bleeding related to dose, and maybe this was just a chance finding, and the confidence interval around this 3% is very wide. But I think it was reason enough for the, uh, the sponsor to embark on not one, but two large-scale parallel studies, Tracer and TRA2P. Tracer is a non-ST elevation ACS study in more than 13,000 patients, comparing Vorapaxar to placebo on top of aspirin and clopidogrel. And TRA2P also compares Vorapaxar to placebo in stable patients for secondary prevention after stroke, after MI, or with PAD, 26,000 patients. Both studies have completed enrollment. Unfortunately, only one of them is going to report at the AHA this year. It's going to be Tracer. TRA2P will likely report at ACC next year. What we know, however, is that in January of this year, the DSMB for both trials noticed an excess ICH in patients with prior stroke and was asked to discontinue treatment in patients who had prior stroke. And it seems that, as you remember from Triton, patients who have a history of stroke seem to be at a particularly high risk of bleeding with antiplatelet agents. Whether this means that the study is going to be positive or negative, we will see at the AHA. The other agent, Etopaxar, the Japanese compound, has been studied in a couple of phase two studies Lancelot ACS and Lancelot CAD, both of which were reported in the European Heart Journal. And basically, the studies are too small for us to say much. We can say that there is some modest increase in bleeding, largely driven by minor or minimal bleeding. That's all we can say from the phase two studies. So if I look at the landscape of antiplatelet agents and new anticoagulants, it's quite impressive to see what we have. We have an incredibly diverse landscape to potentially consider for the future. On top or in replacement of what we have, we have today aspirin and clopidogrel, we have the GPIs, and we see that prasugrel is already available, tacagrelor is already available in many countries, cangrelor might be available, elinogrel is coming to studies, vorapaxar and etopaxar are being studied, Carutroban was just discontinued, and you have new other agents that are being studied here. And it's the same with new anticoagulants on top of the various anticoagulants we have we have a, a, a whole number of new anticoagulants, both IV and oral, that are being also tested in ongoing clinical trials so that the, the future looks bright. The question is twofold. The first question is how many antithrombotics superimposed will our patients tolerate without having too much bleeding? And I think that we're probably getting to the limit of what our patients can tolerate. And the other question, and I'll stop here, is how many new drugs will our health systems be able to pay for, given the price of the existing agents that we have to, uh, to, to pay for. I think I'll stop here and take questions. Thank you very much.